All right. Well, we continue now in our series called Sacred Sandals. We've been talking about the life of Jesus Christ and what it means to walk in the way of Jesus. And we've been talking about how that to be a follower of Jesus, you have to actually follow Jesus. And uh, so how do you do that? We've been talking about how he lived and some of the main components that made up the life of Christ. And today I want to talk to you about the way of success. The way of success. Last week we talked about surrender and how that when we do give our lives over to the Lord and we surrender and we say, Lord, take it all, that three things will happen in that moment of surrender. First, we'll experience peace. The moment you give up and let God take control, an overwhelming peace will saturate your heart. Secondly, you can expect miracles because now that God, everything's been turned over to God, He can begin to work and He can begin to flow and you're not interrupting and interfering anymore. Well, once miracles and the supernatural start happening, the second thing we said was you're going to experience success because God is now working you're going to start to succeed in different areas of your life. Now, sometimes Christians uh, don't like to talk much about success because for whatever reason, um, we've been led to believe that it's kind of worldly, it's kind of selfish and carnal to, to want to be successful. So instead, we talk about being blessed. I don't care what term you use, but everybody wants to prosper and succeed and experience the blessing of the Lord. I've never heard of anyone saying that Christians are supposed to fail, so we're not supposed to fail, we're supposed to succeed. And our definition of success is so important because it will determine the pathway of your life. Whatever success means to you will determine the direction of your life. Abraham Lincoln put it this way, quote, Always bear in mind that your own resolution to success is more important than any other one thing. So what, whatever you think success is for you, that begins to shape and define who you are and how you go about things. If success to you is a six-figure income or, you know, for some people that's not success, it's a seven-figure income, okay, well then that's going to affect your whole life because you, you want self-worth, you want to be good enough, you want to be accepted, you want to be successful, so i got to go out and earn that kind of an income. It shapes your whole life. Or perhaps success to you is having a certain amount of power or a certain amount of position, so now you're always concerned about you know, getting promoted and climbing up the corporate ladder and, you know, whatever you've got to do to make that happen, the ends justifies the means. And so you step on people to get higher and it just begins to affect your whole life. Or maybe to you, success is social status, you know, what circles you run with. And so you're always trying to you know, be around successful people and you're dropping names everywhere. Oh, I know this person and I just went to this concert and got a backstage pass and man, I'm so cool. Whatever success means to you will really determine everything about your life. So what is success and what does the Bible say about it and what was the success that Jesus exemplified? Well, first of all, success refers to the attainment of a proposed object. The attainment of a proposed object. Whatever it is that you're going after, you attain it, that's your success. So, success is a very individualized thing. It's not just, you know, one blanket definition. What may be success for you is different than success for me because we all have different goals in life and what we think success is. But it also refers to, to something that comes after. That's why the word success and succession go together. If you're truly successful, then the results and what follows out of it is going to prosper and go forward as well. 
Well, we see this in the life of Christ if you'll turn to John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, we have this high priestly prayer of Jesus. In the last week of his life, he knows he's going to go to the cross. He knows he's going to be resurrected on the third day. He's going to ascend back into heaven. And he begins to intercede for his disciples and for us as you go through the prayer. But we're just going to look at the first five verses here and look at what Jesus accomplished with his life and how successful he was. John chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. I bet that you've never prayed that kind of a prayer before. I mean, have you ever prayed, God, glorify me. I mean, it just seems so egotistical. We would never say, you know, glorify me. Like, glory is only for God. But here, Jesus says, glorify me so that I can then glorify you. Glory refers to the outward expression of beauty or majesty or greatness. That's why Paul said a woman's hair is her glory. It's one of the things that shows off or manifests her beauty. So Jesus here is saying, Father, manifest in my life success and blessing and your prosperity in me so that I can magnify you, so that I can lift you up. In other words, bless me so that I can be a blessing. You can't give away what you don't have. So Jesus here is literally saying, glorify me that I may glorify you. Verse 2, as you have given him, that is referring to himself, authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Everybody wants to live and live forever if possible. Jesus here defines what eternal life is. Notice that he doesn't even talk about the quantity of time. He talks about the quality of time. Because the truth is, everyone is going to live forever. It doesn't matter what you believe. You're a soul. And your soul is going to live on after this life. Whether in heaven or in hell, whether with God or separated from God, you have eternal life. You've been created in the image of God. The question is whether or not you will have a good quality of life for eternity. Jesus defines quality life as knowing God, experiencing God, walking with God, having a relationship with God. That's what gives us quality of life, and that's what's going to make heaven so amazing. God's going to be there, and with God, every good thing. And so he says, I have come that I may give eternal life to whomever you've given me, that I may help them discover the highest quality of life. And he says in verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. That is a very succinct statement of Jesus' success. Mission accomplished. He could literally say, Lord, I've glorified you and I've done what you've put me on this earth to do. I've fulfilled my mission. I've been successful. Verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. When Jesus became a man in the incarnation, he temporarily set aside his glory. 
He didn't operate in all of the attributes of God. He willingly set aside some of his deity to become a man, and then he was given it back after the resurrection and the ascension back into heaven. But we see here that Jesus accomplished his purpose. Jesus was successful by his own definition. And certainly Jesus was successful by virtually any measure you might use. For example, if achievement and accomplishment is success to you, is there anyone who has been more influential than Christ? I mean, think about it. Jesus has had such an impact on humanity that we divide time between that which took place before he showed up and that which took place after. This is the year 2013. 2013 years since what? Since Jesus showed up. That's success. Nobody's measuring history by Gary Galbraith. It's phenomenal. You and I are here singing songs about someone who lived over 2,000 years ago. He is still the, the most successful, influential, powerful person and most popular person to have ever lived on this planet. That is success. And people want to be more like him. And if he were to show up today, the whole world would flock for a glimpse of Jesus Christ. It would be, you want to talk about hits on YouTube? Forget about it. But he was not just successful occupationally or missionally. He was successful relationally. Because in a sense, isn't it true that true success has to be measured under your own roof? You can be very successful out in the business world, have lots of money in the bank, but if you're failing at home, you're failing. So what was it like there at home with Jesus? Well, you realize that the family of Jesus didn't always understand who he was. And there were times when Jesus was doing ministry and talking about who he was and what he came to do and casting out devils and all kinds of stuff. And at one point, his mom and some of his brothers showed up to take him home. It's like, Jesus, you are nuts. Nobody does the stuff that you're doing. and Nobody talks like you. Come home before you hurt yourself, you know? And they said, hey, your mother and your brothers are outside. And Jesus said, hey, my mother and my brothers are those who know the will of God and obey it. And so it took some time for the family members of Jesus to really begin to understand who he was and believe in who he was. But you want to talk about relational success. The family members of Jesus all became followers of Jesus and worshipers of Jesus. One example being James, who wrote that New Testament book called the book of James. He was also a son of Joseph. They had the same father, uh, the same mother, but different fathers. Jesus coming from God the Father and James coming from Joseph, but both born from Mary. So James was the half-brother of Jesus. And when James wrote his epistle, he introduces himself, James, a slave of Jesus Christ. You want to talk about Jesus was authentic and he was the real deal and he lived it all out at home. They saw who he really was and they became followers and worshipers of Jesus, members of his own family. So Jesus was a success, however you might define it. So how can you and I be successful and model Jesus and do what God has put us on this earth to do. Well, let me give you four things that regardless of what your purpose in life is and what success means to you, these four elements have to be a part of your life because universally they're a part of a successful life regardless of what your purpose may be. Number one, in order to be successful, you have to be yourself. 
You have to be yourself. In other words, whatever you do and accomplish in life, if you're not your authentic self, if you're being hypocritical or pretending or never really growing into who God intended you to be, you're not successful. Part of being successful because you've been created in the image of God and you're here to learn and grow is for you to become the you that God created you to be. That's why you're here. So success has to contain you being your best self, your authentic self. That's part of success. Zig Ziglar once said, success means doing the best we can with what we have. Success is the doing, not the getting. In the trying, not the triumph. Success is a personal standard reaching for the highest that is in us, becoming all that we can be, end quote. So true. You're here to grow. You're here to be you and discover who you really are. That is success. Number two, success has to contain not only being your authentic self, but reflecting God. If God is not glorified by whatever you're doing, if you're not reflecting the attributes of God, if people are not seeing Jesus in what you're doing, you're not successful. No matter what you're out there doing, no matter what your position or, or how much money you have or property or whatever, if God isn't seen in what you're doing, it's not a success. We need to reflect the Lord in what we do. Like the moon reflects the light of the sun. The moon has no light of its own. It can only reflect the light of the sun. In the same way, you and I have no life of our own. Our job is to reflect the light of Jesus and to be close to him. And like we sang about, invite his Holy Spirit to saturate us and overcome us and move upon us so that that spiritual component of Christ is operating and we're reflecting Jesus to people. So to be a success, you have to be yourself. You have to reflect God. Number three, you have to add value to others. If you're not adding value and loving the people that are around you throughout your journey to be successful, you're not a success. If you're tearing people down in the process of your success instead of building them up, you're failing. That's not success. True success is loving people, adding value to people. That's why there was something so beautiful in hearing Pastor Tim describe what a blessing it is for him after mentoring Taylor from the age of 16 to this point of ordination today. Pastor Tim has added value to Taylor for year after year after year, lifting him up, encouraging him. That's success. And that's such a beautiful thing because we live in a world that is a fallen world and things are constantly sagging and sinking and it's so easy to put people down if you're putting people down to get ahead you're not succeeding success is lifting people up taking people with you and bringing out the best in other people around you as you go about this journey in life that is true success and then number four enjoying life Whatever it is that you're doing to try and succeed, if you're not enjoying the process, you're failing. And it's interesting, you know, some people are like, oh man, success to me is having a six-figure income and 10% body fat and, and being president of the company. And that's all really hard to achieve, but man, they got it now. And you look at them and they are miserable. It's amazing how so many successful people are miserable. Are you really succeeding if you're not happy? Life is meant to be enjoyed. Life is to be lived. And so what I'm saying is, you could be successful by the world's definition, but if you're not your true self, if you're not reflecting God, if you're not adding value to others, if you're not enjoying life, you're failing. The opposite is just as true. Let this free you today. 
if you're your authentic self, becoming who the Lord wants you to be, and you're reflecting God, and you're adding value to and, and loving the people around you, and you're enjoying life, you're successful. Some of you are like, who knew? <laughs> yeah, you're already a success. In fact, there are other people that have more stuff than you and more position than you and more power than you. They look at you and they're like, you can't be that happy. I'm way up here and you're way down there. Wipe that smirk off your face. You're supposed to be more miserable than I am. How can you be that happy when you don't have as much stuff as me? Well, because I define success differently. I don't have to have all that stuff to be a success. I just need to be the person God created me to be, reflect him, add value to others, and enjoy life. I'm doing that, and I'm feeling good. Right? Let me show this to you in the life of Joseph real quick. Turn back to Genesis chapter 39, and we'll, we'll wrap up with this. Genesis chapter 39. You know the story. Joseph had been given a coat of many colors by his dad. He had a dream that his whole family was going to be bowing down to him. His brothers were like, man, we are so sick of you acting like you're superior to us. They decided to get rid of him, and they were going to kill him. And then one of the brothers is like, hey, we could get rid of him and make some money, so let's sell him as a slave. And there was this caravan of Ishmaelites coming by, and they sold Joseph. We pick up the story in Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. So let's take a look at where Joseph is at with his life. He's a slave. He literally has no money, no connections, Nothing. Talk about rock bottom. He has absolutely nothing. Does not even have his own freedom to try and make something of his life. Verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. What? The guy has nothing. He just got sold out from his own family, shipped down to Egypt, and just got purchased like a sack of potatoes. And the Bible calls him successful? By what definition is Joseph successful? He had God. The Lord was with Joseph. And because of that, he was successful. Understand this principle. Success is not about what you have. Success is all about who you have. And if you have God, you are already a success. Amen? <clears throat> the Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw, verse 3, that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. It's like Joseph had the Midas touch. Everything that he did turned to gold. God was prospering him left and right. So, verse 4, Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Joseph began to prosper, and the people around him began to prosper, all because the Lord was with him. When you're walking with God, you're a success regardless of what else is going around. 
regardless of what other people may think. And, and when you're walking with God, He's going to begin to touch things. He's going to begin to move. He's going to begin to work. And you're going to be a success. And you'll know it instantly. The moment you surrender, the moment you get right with God, that's why people say, man, it's like all is right with the world. Maybe nothing changed in the world. Maybe nothing changed in your bank account. But when you got right with God, you realized, hey, everything's the way it's supposed to be. I'm a success. So how come some people don't reach success while the relationship with God isn't where it should be? But there's these three things I want to close with, three obstacles that prevent people from accomplishing their goals. Number one, a lack of clear and precise vision. If being a success is you doing what God's put you on this earth to do, you need to know what your purpose is. You have a clear and concise vision of what God wants you to do with your life. Jesus did. Pastor Tim taught us a couple weeks ago that Jesus was a man of purpose. He knew what he was here to do. And that why, that's why he could pray in John chapter 17, Lord, I've done it. Do you know what you're here to do? How can you reach your goals if you don't know what they are? I was talking to a guy last week, having some troubles in his life. So sat down with him, and the first question I asked him was, what's your purpose? What do you want to do with your life? Because he's just kind of been running around, running amok a little bit. What do you want to do with your life? And he said, I don't know. Literally does not know what to do with his life. That is not a place you want to be. Because if you don't wake up in the morning knowing what to do to construct your life, you are going to destruct your life. One of the reasons why people don't reach their goals, they don't have a clear and concise vision of what they want the outcome to be. Number two, there's a failure to plan for failure. You had better expect some setbacks and for some things to go wrong and things to not work out the way that you planned. Winston Churchill said, success consists of going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. <laughs> you had better be prepared that things aren't always going to work out right, but you got to press on. Expect there to be some failure in your life. I've read this incredible book by Erwin Lutzer called Failure, The Back Door to Success. And the whole principle of the book is that how that most great men of God in the Bible became their greatest after their worst failure. And he just documents it through Scripture. How that, that process of brokenness and that process of surrender made people like Abraham and Moses and David greater after their worst failure than ever before. We tend to want to write people off, especially you know, spiritual leaders and pastors when they have a failure because we don't want to be associated with it. And I would never want to sit under that person's teaching ever again. But God says, oh, I can do something in them now that I was never even able to do before. Just wait till you see what I can do after I get through with them now. God knows how to turn failure into success. Thank God. And number three, third reason why people don't reach their goals is there's a lack of, of sustained passion. They only go in that direction for a little while and they get sidetracked and they chase this and they chase that. Bill Cosby said, in order to succeed, your desire for success should be greater than your fear of failure. You've got to have a passion for something. You've got to go after that passion consistently. And as you succeed and do it in the right way, it's going to bring glory to God and you're truly going to be success. I'll leave you with this quote. God gave us two ends. One to sit on and the other to think with. Success depends upon which one you use. Heads you win, tails you lose.